Good evening and welcome to Information Please, your Peoria Public Library on the air, bringing you information about your library and your community. And this evening I've brought Amber Lowry, who works in our local history and genealogy um, department, among many other things she does, because she and uh, one of her co-workers have developed a whole new beginning genealogy instruction program booklet thing. And so we thought we'd come today and talk about how you can get started in genealogy with Peoria Public Library. Hi, Amber. Hi. I didn't give. Doing? I'm good. I didn't give a very good description of that. But what you tell me what it is that the two of you have created. Well, uh, my coworker Barb Brown. She works mm -hmm. out at the North Branch. She and I are both very passionate about genealogy, as you well know. Yes. And um, we. With the intergovernmental agreement that Peoria Public Library has with District 150, what we wanted to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to go into the schools. And while we were developing a packet to bring to the school age students, we thought it might be helpful to have a packet for adults who are beginning their genealogy uh, journey quest <laughs> quest journey yeah well quest because a lot of times you don't know what you're doing yeah. um but uh we're very excited with how it's turning out we've searched long and hard for the appropriate um forms to fill out for uh, instructional guides for uh, helpful hints and we're just very excited that it's finally uh getting to the point where we can hand them out yeah so. and so that means when somebody comes into your department and says, well, I want to do my family tree, you've got a really good starting place for them to go. Exactly. We, um, what we always encourage people to do is to start with themselves. Yes. Whose story do you know best but your own? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know the experiences you've lived with your life. And actually, we encourage them to write down everything they can think about and find out that they actually know a lot more than they think they do. Um, but in the past, we've just kind of stuttered around, printed off a few forms that we found online and uh, sent them on their merry way to go ask questions. And that's about as good as saying, yeah, there's a problem with your car, but just fill it up with gas. So, <coughs> bless you. Excuse me. <coughs> bless okay. you. Go on. So excited. <laughs> um, so we're, we wanted to make sure. <coughs> bless you. I okay. have an effect on people. Yes. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had a way to sit down with them and say, this is what you are going to be looking for and not just random get right. started. Yeah, I've, I've um, been privileged to take a peek at what you've done and it's, it gives it everything somebody needs to actually get started in one place. So you're not saying, well, you could find this form here and this form here and just hand it to them. So especially this time of year around the holidays when people are getting together with family members and they start to talk about you know, great grandfather or whatever, or your mm -hmm. grandfather, this is the time to write things down. Exactly. So. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, my family, a lot of the older generation is already gone. So the only people I have to ask are my parents. Right. And so when I ask these stories, um, it's slightly disappointing for me because all the stories I grew up with, I've managed to debunk a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so I do take it with a grain of salt, but more and more I'm finding lots more, um, stories that I hadn't known before. My family has a group on Facebook and I started asking my aunts and uncles, what mm -hmm. were your vacations like? And I'm learning more and more about my grandparents in my 30s than I ever learned about them when I was a child. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's been just, and this packet, what we're hoping to bring is when I started my genealogy, I had no clue what I was doing. And so I wanted to provide everything I thought a beginner would need and then I went to a couple sources that I thought I could um, guinea pig on and say, mm -hmm. if you were going to start your genealogy and somebody gave you this, would this be helpful? And I've gotten some good feedback and we added a few things. We took away a couple of things and I really think what we have now is um, pretty good. Great. So, Well, and we talked about our intergovernmental agreement with District 150 and having this available to school children and explain why a teacher would be interested in doing this with students. Well, again, it's it's about finding your story. So it's not just genealogy. A lot of um, a lot of English teachers can use projects like this to teach students how to write narratives. Um, it also teaches them to research, uh, to find stuff out in history, what was going on with your ancestors when the Civil War broke out. Mm -hmm. 
were was your family on a plantation or was your family in the north were they abolitionists you know you you have that kind of things to think about um also genealogy is just interesting to look at immigration mm -hmm. and why your family came over or why they chose to move to central illinois that's a good lesson in world history as well yes and and i know you did do a lot of work on looking up um if different parts of this project satisfy different standards that teachers have to meet. So exactly. it does end up being a, a great launch point for a variety of projects. I mean, you can even do math with generations, how older young people are. And, and look at how culturally yeah, things culture. change. Um, you know, they're, nowadays people aren't getting married until they're in their late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while I'll look and I'll find a marriage where there was a 13 year old girl and that frankly I'm just like what yeah and you know by all accounts it was a happy marriage um, it's just things change that's, that's just not how it would happen today mm -hmm. and so but it's fascinating yeah now me. we tend to think if people get married at 20 or 21 they're too young <laughs> yeah so yeah, we do it, it it was just a very nice way to look at how things have changed as far as marriages, about having children, about moving entire families mm -hmm. across an ocean. Mm -hmm. Or even across the going. country, because so many people came to New York. And then moved west. And then moved to, and why, did, you know, why did they come to Peoria? Why did they you know, come to this area? But that happened where the westward migration or migrations from the south. Well, and Peoria, of, Peoria had a specific advantage. It was not only on the rail lines, it had the river. Yes. So it had a lot of transportation coming to it, mm -hmm. which made it easily accessible and made it a booming town. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very easy to get to. Yeah. So we thought, you and I did, that we'd give some our viewers some examples, and we used our own families to do this. I actually yeah. used my husband's family. My family was an Imperial very early, but my husband's family was. And so we've got a picture here that, whoops. Our uh, controller is not going there we go. right. This is a picture of my husband's ancestor, Elizabeth Lang Kaiser. And this is when she was a, a young woman. She was born in Germany and came as a young child. Her mother died in a tenement slum in um, New York City. And her father relocated here, moved back and forth between Chicago and Peoria several times, going from being a tailor to a farmer. But then he remarried and left. And that was sort of all I knew about her. Mm -hmm. And so tell us the kind of sources we had that we found more about Well, yesterday Elizabeth. when you sent me that, I looked at it and I said, okay, I, you had told me she was a maid and she lived in a judge's home. Mm -hmm. So I went and looked at the 1860 census, which is available through Ancestry.com, which we have a subscription to. So you can come to the library and use Ancestry.com. It's not as easy as the commercials make you think it is, no. but it, it is um, a fun tool. Yeah. It helped me find out the name of the judge and his family, and I was able to use an old city directory from that time to find out where his home was, and it, it no longer exists. It is now yeah. a parking deck in downtown. It's but, actually where Commerce Bank is, right yes. off of Main Street, and it's where we drive through to the drive up you know, mm -hmm. banking machine and teller all the time. Yeah. And <laughs> that's where the home was that she was a maid in. Yeah. And, and, and it's odd to think about that. Yeah, but. it's so, so fascinating. This is why genealogy is fascinating. It never occurred to me going to the bank there for years and years that I was driving through basically the ghost of, of the home where my husband's ancestor worked as a maid. Exactly. And just, and you think about that, you know, um, her being there during the Civil War, what was going on in Peoria during the Civil War. I know there was, you know, they're so close to Courthouse Square. I know there was a lot of different fights and demonstrations and riots and things during the Civil War because Peoria was a very divided city. It was. But those are other things you can find out about. But some of those resources are, are some of the things that aren't as easy to find online. And while there's a lot of online resources and things you can find, when you come in, you guys have a lot more. The, the downtown location in our local history and genealogy mm -hmm. department, we have a lot of information about Peoria as it grew as a city that is not available really anywhere else. One of our fantastic collections that we have <clears throat> 
is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Oakford collection. Um, Aaron Oakford wrote family histories of uh, pioneer families and prominent families of Peoria. And this one is, uh, the, this picture is the residence of Patrick Ward, who is actually my third great grandfather. He was the first uh, to come from this line of my family to Peoria. And he did come to Peoria. And um, this picture is actually when it was the Crescent Motel, which was raised in oh, the 60s. Okay. But um, people who are older than me may remember the Crescent Motel. This it was actually his family residence. And it wasn't until uh, years after he had gone, um, he had left it to one of his children after his child um, had passed away. Um, the wife sold it because it was probably 110, 120 years old by then and probably yeah. more work to keep up than to... Sure, um, people wanted to move to something And modern. this is actually on Hamilton uh, where there's a... It's not a parking deck, but it, there's something built there now. So mm -hmm. I, I remember looking it up, but it is um, on the 400 block that's, of Hamilton. That's another fun thing to do is to almost make a map of if you have ancestors that were in Peoria early. I did that with the, when the 1940 census came out a couple of years ago. I Made managed to find all went. four grandparents and they lived within a few blocks of each other. Yeah, it's so. interesting where people move to and, and how they move. That's so my husband's family all stayed you know, in the same area in Peoria for a hundred years before they just recently moved away. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, so it's fun, it's a fun thing to do with your family or as a school project or whatever to find out stuff. And this is more with the Oakford. This this is actually the biography part. He didn't okay, just so post he did pictures. Pictures and a, this wrote a biography. This talks about when on the shelf you would have to ask for them. But the staff is always willing to help oh, you absolutely. find them. Oh, absolutely. We are more than happy to bring stuff out. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, this is um, this is a picture. We don't have the have just an the index. Record. Um, sometimes we have probate records, we have um, obituary indexes, stuff like that. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be the forms. It is not going to be something. But it can tell you that it, it can exists. Give you, it can give you a place to look. Yeah, it tells you whether it exists or not. Possibly. This shelf is responsible for my interest in genealogy. <laughs> I was showing off that I could look up where my grandparents were buried mistakenly looking for my grandmother under her maiden name. Uh, Remembered, this is alphabetical, she would be under her married name. And yes. when I looked, there she was with her in-laws, who I never knew were buried in that cemetery. Oh, so that got you started. That's what got me started. I called my mom and I said, why did you never tell me this? We go to the cemetery every year. She said, didn't know. I said, you were 18 when your grandma died. How did you not know? She looked at me and she said, that was 40 years ago. That's not funny. <laughs> So, and people do forget. Yeah, and people so, do forget. We've had that same experience with our family, not here, but in Rock Island, which is not all that far away. And we do have some records for other parts of Illinois, just not the in-depth like the city directories and that kind of thing. We tend to focus around the Tri-County area, yeah. um, although Tazewell County does have a very good genealogy center. Um, but we we try to focus on Peoria and the surrounding counties. Um, mm -hmm. We have what we have, and we do try to expand, but we have to make choices. So yeah, yeah, and and uh, the, in addition to these vital records, I know that I found family history, and there's some file cabinets over on on the side. It, yeah, in the uh, well, these are the this is the other side of the room. This is the microfilm. Yeah. So this is where you look up the old papers and everything, and we do have mm -hmm. newspapers back to 1837. However, it's not going to be like today's newspaper where you look up and you find the obituary section and you go to that page. No. <laughs> no, and it's, um, I compare it to Facebook today. There's tons of stories about so-and-so did this or so-and-so had this. Oh yeah, meeting. it's like so-and-so has their, their relatives are visiting from, they'll even say came to Sunday dinner from Pekin. Yeah, and because that was a big deal to do mm -hmm. at the time. So they're not as informational as we could hope yeah. Um, and they're a bit dark to read, but they're doable. Um, and actually, older papers don't have a lot of cemetery or obituary information. No. Or you birth know. announcements, that type of thing. It, it's usually 
uh, a week before, you might find a little thing that mentions so and so has been under the weather. Yeah. Or is gravely ill, but yeah. you're not necessarily going to find things that old. Yeah. Um, but they are worth a look just to see what was going on in Peoria at the time. I know we used them when we had the Louise May Alcott yes, exhibit. Yes, we did. So we were able to find some interesting information. We looked from the up what area. was happening in Louisa May Alcott's life, and then we looked on the same times in Peoria and found the same sorts of stories going on, the same things that were happening in her life during the Civil War were happening here in Peoria. So that was, that was interesting to post. And then on the other side of the room, you mentioned file cabinets. We mm -hmm. do have some donated family trees that people have sent in. Those actually belong to the Genealogy Society, but we house them for them. They, I won't say we have every family, and I won't say that they're correct. Yeah, it's but also it's a place to a, start. It's kind of a, hey, maybe there's some information in here to look at. Yeah. So um, one of the other things we have is uh, this is actually a an obituary and death notice index that we did for the 1912 papers. Okay. Um, That's a huge help. You know, yeah. to sit and go through that microfilm every single day, making yourself dizzy, watching the things fly by. And again, 1912, we're not talking. We have an obituary section. You're reading every single yeah, article. Yeah, because that could be anywhere in that paper. little things. And what we tried to do is include as much information as possible. A lot of times in these old papers, women were only mentioned as... Mrs. Mrs. William, yeah. you know, not her name. So I, this one I did uh, with the help of one of our recent retirees. She had started it and I mm -hmm. finished it. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to make sure that we had as much information as possible in this index to help people find more information. Yeah, very cool. So, um, and then. And we hope, of course, at some point to be able to put these on our webpage in digital form. So. People yes. out of town can find this stuff and then know if they need to make a trip here. But naturally, you can always call mm -hmm. or email us and we can see if we can find the information too. Yeah. And the, I, we should point out, though, that there is a form on our webpage. There is. Um, either under genealogy, under contact us. It's quite a few places. And people don't want to fill out the form, but honestly, filling out the form. The form is the best way. We'll um, give, make sure that you give us the information that our staff needs to find And those go directly stuff. to the people who handle it. Yeah. Um, as opposed to sending an email to public relations and yeah. getting it <laughs> forwarded to the right person. Which is what happens. I get a lot so. of those and I reply that, no, you must fill out this form. And I know people don't want to do it, but honestly, that's what gets you the most comprehensive answer. Exactly. Um, this shelf, which is actually towards the back of our room, mm -hmm. this is our city directories. Now, we only have city directories available from 1927 to current out on the shelf because in the cases of older directories, they're just too it's old fragile. and too fragile to be handling regularly. In fact, some of these are falling apart just from overuse. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating in them um, when you're looking for stuff is like this is a picture of um, one of the pages on the inside and mm -hmm. I actually pulled this up because this uh, the Henry Ward that's listed on here is my great-grandfather he was the grandson of Patrick Ward mm -hmm. and it mentions that his wife's name was Nettie they had four children he worked for Ward Brothers which was a grocery store and they lived on Greenlawn which was a house he built and raised his family in then gave it to my grandmother and she raised her family in my mother grew up there and then uh, I actually lived there for six months when so I was a child fun. so how fun to be able to, there, to see so. that yeah yeah so the kinds of things you can find in a city directory are occupation the address they lived at and and it's it's fun just even if you're not doing serious research you're in the library Stop in and randomly look up, you know, last name well, for one this, of your this ancestors. Is, this one is fascinating because it says their address is 921 Greenlawn. What a lot of people don't know is in the 50s, a lot of addresses changed. Yeah, they renumbered them. They, and people also don't realize that street names have changed exactly. even. Exactly. Um, when we did a lot of the research about our Carnegie Library, Lincoln Branch, you find the oddest names for streets in and around there and the highways and things have been renamed. And you think about MacArthur, when did MacArthur get famous? World yeah. War II. What was it called before then? 
So you, if you think you have a mistake or a street that doesn't exist, the come one I hear a lot. The old map. The one I hear a lot is Seventh Street. I don't yeah. think about Seventh Street in Peoria because I know it as Martin Luther King. Yeah. 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 So. Um, but we have the maps, and a lot of these city directories do have maps in. But we have the old maps that show you what something was called on a, on a certain year or date, and so you can find that that way. Exactly. And uh, those kinds of clues can help too because sometimes you can find out about a company, what somebody did. You may get clues as to what happened to people or why they came here if they were. I don't know, what did your ancestor do for a living? Well, at this point he was a grocery man. He and his yeah. brothers ran a grocery store. He later became interested in banking and um, he was the president of Southside Bank. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and I, I believe at the time of his death, he was still like on the board. He had retired, but he was still on the board. And did you know all these things before you researched this? Or I had this known recent that, knowledge? I had known that he was president of Southside Bank from my mom and from my family and everything. Um, and I knew that some of my mom's cousins still worked for the bank and everything. But I had not um, really put it together. The, the grocery business, when I mentioned it later, the they're like, oh, yeah, we remember Grandpa saying something about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the man passed away, you know, 10 years before I was born, so I didn't have the opportunity to ask him these yeah. kinds of questions. Yeah, so. ask him about things, sure. And we had the experience um, with my husband's family, people that came here during World War II, but we were able to go to the town in Indiana they came from and found out they used to have a grocery business, and actually the store that they owned was still standing there as an empty shell. It was in a little, basically, ghost town now. Mm -hmm. But And how fun to be able to see that. And we had the experience, too, of the names of little settlements changing and could not find, could not find, could not find the town we were looking for that was written on a photograph. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it was in an atlas, but it was in like where the crack of the pages were, and you had to press really hard to find it. We actually have a book down in local history called Illinois Place Names, and it does talk about old cities. Um, like every once in a while, I come across something called Circleville, and it's uh. actually um, over in Tazewell County. I can't remember off the top of my head mm -hmm. what it is now, but mm -hmm. um, there's also there's another name, and I'm trying to remember. Um, that was, I looked it up when my great-great-grandparents got married in Tazewell County, mm -hmm. and it gave a city, and I'm like, what city is that? Well, it turns out it's near what's called Morton now. Ah, okay, um, but just something that was absorbed or disappeared. And well, and you hear sometimes people talk about Averyville. Yes. And it wasn't until... Or Richwoods Township, which yeah. a lot of people are starting to forget what Richwoods Township was. Yeah, and a lot of those are places that at one time were considered a separate part. Mm -hmm. In fact, where I live in Peoria, we would never call north of Peoria. Um, but at one time, it was known as Mechanicsburg. And we're talking by Lauk School. Yeah. Lauk School, nobody would consider the north of the city. Yeah, but it was at one time. Even Because at one time, the city hadn't come up the bluff, even. Yeah. Well, and even doing research for the library history. You know, mm -hmm. when when Lakeview was built in the 70s, that was the north of the city. Oh yeah, it and, was the north And the library of the needed, city, the... needed service out there. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't help but compare it to when we built our own North Branch, mm -hmm. how much of the language was the same, yes. that we had moved north and we needed more library service. Yeah, so. moving away from the river, but early on, of course, Peoria is an old French settlement, and it's hard to find those records, but when you start looking at the American records in about 1819, and you look at, at the Eads that came here mm -hmm. first, a little group of them, and Fultons, and those sorts of people, we do have records, we do have diaries, and the WPA, which is the Works Progress Administration from the Depression, went through and made us those great little files. Which I'm currently trying to digitize so that we can have them yeah. available for many more years yeah. as parts of them are crumbling. Yes, so. and if, you look, if you're looking for the early pioneer families, we do have plenty of information. You just may, are probably gonna have to ask for help to yes. find it. But it is absolutely fascinating to, to read about. But those folks were all living down 
in what's our basically our warehouse district now mm -hmm. and along that area and it took a long time to move for the city to move north as far as say Lauk School mm -hmm. in Peoria and even longer to move I mean out by Sheridan Village where Lakeview branches mm -hmm. um, that's where I grew up as a child and we had cows in the backyard when I was little they had to fence in the yard so the cows wouldn't get me when I was outside. Well, I, I remember when they, I actually do remember when they first built Target and when they built Grand Prairie. And I do remember mm -hmm. when they built Target thinking, I really thought I was going to get through my life without saying, I remember when this was Fields. <laughs> no such luck. And I was so disappointed that I was going mm -hmm. to be able to say that. Well, you don't even want to know that I used to walk barefoot from... Uphill both ways. Yeah, from... <laughs> From Sheridan to the pool at Lakeview Park, there was nothing. It was just one big field from Sheridan all the way to the swimming pool. It's just that by itself. So enough of this. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> we invite everybody to come to our local history and genealogy um, department. Our staff there is more than happy to give you one-on-one -on -one help. Bring your pencil and pen or your computer. You have a great time looking up your family history. Or look at our online resources at peoriapubliclibrary.org. We'll see you next week on Information, Please. <music>